Greetings, and thanks for tuning in. My name is Jones, and I'm the founder, CEO of the 501c3 Not-for-Profit Inmates for Change. Now, normally, when I do this show, I would not have an individual right here at my right. But because we were rushed through this, we're going to have a comedy of errors tonight. So the information will be pertinent and serious information, but don't think that we're not. To my right, I have Mr. Dave Olson, actually Dr. Dave Olson, but we're going to get to him in just a second. So if he falls asleep, someone let me know. Once again, my name is Jones, and I'm the CEO of Inmates for Change. We're, we provide reentry services to individuals returning home from incarceration and individuals who are in the community that are experiencing significant challenges in securing gainful employment, independent housing, and successive progressive reintegration into family, community, society, and of course, corporate America. At Inmates for Change, our motto is breaking the bondage of destructive thinking. And I like to add, one mind at a time. Now, Inmates for Change provides brokerage services to individuals in need of education, to those who are affected by substance abuse, shelter residency for homeless, and referral services to vocational training programs. Now, I've got to read this because this was something new that my staff came up with. And I hope you all can forgive me. I was supposed to memorize it before I got on the air, and I didn't. So, don't beat me up too bad. Inmates Change also offers a rehabilitative education curriculum workshop initiative entitled Path to Purpose. The Path to Purpose workshop initiative, they are facilitated in classroom settings that convenes for 90 minutes, three days a week, and for a duration of six to 24 weeks. The participants are introduced to critical thinking skills, interpersonal interaction skills, peaceful conflict resolution, excuse me, peaceful conflict resolution strategies, positive self-image enforcement, relationship issues, spiritual connectedness and mindfulness, corrective behavior management, and finally, productive lifestyle change. Now, for those of you who are interested in contacting us at Inmates for Change to supplement your existing program curriculum, we can be reached at, I'm learning this thing as I go, here's our contact information. Inmates for Change, where we can be reached between 9.30 a.m. and 2 p.m. Monday through Friday at 773-746-3075. Again, 773-746-3075. Our website information is inmatesforchange.wixsite.com slash inmatesforchange. Now, I know that's a mouthful. But that's why the card is still sitting there, so that you can get it. And for our email, we are inmatesforchange at gmail.com. So let me give you just a few more seconds to take a look at the website information. I-N-M-A-T-E-S-F-O-R-C-H-A-N-G-E dot W-I-X-S-I-T-E dot C-O-M slash I-N-M-A-T-E-S. F-O-R-C-H-A-N-G-E, Inmates for Change. Now, on this show, we feature passionate guests who are representatives of organizations that are on the front lines of the struggle to reduce recidivism and the dysfunction in our communities. Our guests and their respective organizations, they work tirelessly, I'm going to tell you. They're offering services, resources, and pertinent information to assist genuinely interested individuals as they strategically navigate the minefield of successful reintegration into family, community, society, and corporate America. With that being said, I would like to introduce the guest to my right, Mr. Dave Olson. Dave, thank you so much for calling. I should say Dr. Dave Olson. Thank you for having me. Thank you for showing up. I really mean it. I gave Dave short notice about four months ago to <laughs> come on the show, and we're going to get started. Dave, I've got a series of questions, and because my memory is so bad, I had to use a card, a script card that I have here. I hope it's okay with you. Yep. Okay, great. Now, question number one, Dave, is are you relaxed? Are you okay? Yep, yep I'm good. Okay, you ready to go? Yeah, we're, we're good. Okay, we're going to get it going. Uh, please let the viewers know what your position is and describe the duties you perform in that capacity. All right, uh, generally speaking, what I try to do in my work is uh, research and evaluation, uh, broadly speaking. So 
Um, my goal is to conduct rigorous research and use that research and those findings to shape more effective criminal justice policies and practices. Um, I do that at Loyola University in Chicago. Um, I'm a professor there, and I also am the co-director of Loyola's Center for Criminal Justice Research Policy and Practice. So the way that I, I use my research to improve criminal justice policy and practice, uh, one is through being a faculty member. Um, I teach undergraduate and graduate students um, with the idea that I'm trying to provide them with uh, the knowledge and the information they need to go out and uh, make the world a better place. Um, as co-director of Loyola's Research Center, um, I also do research that's directly responsive to the kinds of questions that practitioners and policymakers in the field of criminal justice are asking uh, with the goal of trying to provide them with good, solid information upon which they can uh, make better policies and implement better programs. Okay, now let me ask you this, uh, before we get into the deeper questions, with your duties and what your performance is in the capacity, are you guys like a consortium of, inf of individuals who are gathering information from different aspects of reentry services or population and statistical yeah. references? Yeah, so, so a lot of our work, uh, it's, it's not just us, obviously. Um, we work a lot with um, community organizations, social okay. service providers, governmental agencies. Uh, really, we try to collaborate with the consumers of the information and also those that are most impacted. Um, really, our goal is to make our research and, and the products that we produce the result of a collaboration um, and also make sure that it's responsive to what the practitioners and the frontline people uh, need to know in order to do their, their jobs more effectively. Okay. Well, with that being said, I understand that you spend a lot of time doing research and to understand what forces are behind the change in the prison population in Illinois. Uh, could you provide us with a sense of what you found in that research? Sure, sure. Um, so in addition to my role at Loyola University as a faculty member, um, I'm also uh, appointed to the advisory boards for the Illinois Department of Corrections, uh, the Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice, and the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority. Um, and all those agencies are very interested in uh, explaining why we see the changes that we do in, in the criminal justice system. Um, and in particular, it changes to the state's prison population. So uh, myself and my colleagues have done a lot of research over the last five to six years to really better understand uh, why is it that Illinois' prison population is the size that it is mm -hmm. uh, and why has it changed over time. Um, the, the one thing I'll say before I get into some of the details is it's a, a fairly complicated reason mm -hmm. or, or, or set of forces. Um, a lot of people assume that it's a pretty simple explanation, that we had a war on drugs uh, that resulted in sending lots of people to prison for uh, drug law violations. <coughs> it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, from the late 1980s to the year 2000, Illinois' prison population doubled. Um, the reasons for that involve decisions that are made or were made across uh, every level of government and every branch of government. Okay. There was a change in crime in the, in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, there was more violence, there was more general crime. Uh, just that alone resulted in more people being arrested and processed through the justice system. Um, in particular, crimes of violence. Okay. Um, so in the early 90s, um, we saw one of the highest rates of homicide in, in Chicago and Illinois that we have um, in the last 40 to 50 years. Um, in addition to more crime occurring and the police responding to additional crime, we also shifted our emphasis on our enforcement of drug laws. Um, so the, the war on drugs that began in the 1980s um, also contributed to the growth in the prison population. Um, so we had more crime, more arrests for drug law violations, um, and in particular drugs like cocaine and, and heroin. Okay. Um, we also saw the courts get tougher and more punitive, so they changed their practices, resulting in more people uh, going to prison. And we also saw some changes in state law uh, that resulted in those people being sentenced to prison, serving longer periods of incarceration. Uh, so what you really saw during the 1990s was this, uh, in essence, a perfect storm, the convergence of all these different forces, uh, more crime, an emphasis on drug enforcement, changes in the practices and policies that affect sentencing. Um, 
We also saw higher rates of recidivism among people being released from prison. Uh, so not only were more people going into prison from the courts, uh, but a larger portion of those individuals were uh, recirculating in the system and being released from prison and then being returned. Um, from our research, what we, what we concluded is um, there was no single crime that drove the increase in the prison population. Uh, some of that increase was more people in prison for drug law violations, uh, but a fair amount of it was also more people in prison for crimes like murder, um, cri crimes involving firearms, because those offenses were uh, increasing in the 1980s uh, and 1990s. So there were a lot of different things that led to the increase in the prison population, a doubling of the population during the 1990s. Uh, what we've seen in recent years is the reversal of a number of these trends. Uh, between 2015 and this year, uh, we've seen a drop in Illinois' prison population of about 20%. Right? So we saw a, a dramatic increase in the 90s. Uh, now we're starting to see a decrease. Uh, the reasons for the decrease are essentially uh, the same reasons for why we saw the increase. Uh, in, the, in the last 10 years or so, there's been less crime in Illinois. Uh, there have been fewer crimes, resulting in fewer people being arrested for those crimes. We've also seen a change in the response to drug law violations. Uh, and in particular, in Chicago, we've seen a dramatic drop in arrests for drug offenses uh, for those crimes involving uh, cocaine and heroin and other drugs uh, beyond marijuana. So just like we saw the police crack down dramatically on their drug enforcement in the 80s and 90s, uh, we've seen a reversal of that where they're placing less of a priority on arresting people for drug law violations um, and a shift towards referring more people to substance abuse treatment services or focusing more on the violent crimes in some of the communities. Uh, we've also seen some changes in sentencing practices. We've seen shifts in the courts where they're no longer relying primarily on prison as a response to crime. They're relying more on alternatives that they see as more effective and more impactful with respect to rehabilitation. So uh, there have been a number of uh, new programs that have emerged in the last 10 years to strengthen community responses to crime and plus, place less of a reliance on incarceration as the primary response to crime. Uh, that said, the state's prison population is still much higher than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and a lot of that has to do with people going to prison for very serious crimes that end up spending an extremely long period of time uh, behind bars. Wow. That, with that information, it leads me to thinking about the specific communities that we have over 2,000, uh, the last time I heard the number, was around 2,000 individuals a month coming home from incarceration to five zip codes or five different communities in the city of Chicago. I know Inglewood, Lawndale, Austin, West Garfield, and I believe Roseland mm -hmm. might be one. And this may sound like a no-brainer, but mm -hmm. you know, in your professional opinion, why are the numbers of people going to prison so high in specific communities? In, in some ways, it it's seems like it's a simple question and a simple answer. Yeah. Uh, again, I think there's a lot more uh, behind it. So, so we have to kind of break, break down why are people from certain communities more likely to be going to prison. Um, part of the explanation um, is that there is more crime in certain communities. And to understand why there's more crime in certain communities, um, we've got to think about what are the factors or the forces that create environments where there's more criminal activity. I agree. Uh, so if there's communities that have limited economic opportunity, uh, the schools are poor performing, um, there's not a lot of resources within the community to provide people with the kinds of services that they could benefit from, uh, those things will lead to more criminal activity. Okay. Right. Uh, where there's more criminal activity, uh, the police tend to focus their resources and, and focus their attention. Um, in particular, in communities where there's high levels of violence. Mm -hmm. um, so, in some ways, um, if we if we put more police into certain communities because there's more crime there, um, a lot of people look at that that and say that's what we would expect, right? Where there's more crime, we should have more 
more police. Um, I think the important thing is there tends to be more crime in certain neighborhoods uh, of the type that really demands and warrants an increased focus and emphasis. So in communities where there's high rates of homicide or high rates of shootings, uh, we'll see more police in those communities. Okay. Uh, while they're in those communities, they're looking for people who've committed crime. Um, but there's also the increased potential that they will observe criminal activity uh, like illegal drug use or drug transactions or some of those kinds of crimes um, that, that generally the public isn't calling the police about, but the police may view it. Um, and so where you have more police, you have more enforcement and, and more capacity for enforcement. Um, so when we look at those specific communities, they tend to have higher crime rates. We put more police there, and because there's more police there, they're making more arrests in those communities. Um, it's not to say there's not a uh, crime that occurs in other communities. Um, for example, patterns of drug use likely are not that different from one community to the next in Chicago. Uh, but there are certain communities that don't have the dramatic police presence because they don't have those other forms of crime or violence that uh, result in more police officers uh, being deployed to those communities. Um, so that's been one of the, the concerns about the overrepresentation of minorities and, and the impact on minority communities of drug enforcement is that there's drug use going on across the city, but it only seems as though drug arrests are being made in certain communities. And it only seems that way, huh? It, it only seems that way. It only seems uh, that way. Right. Um, it, it, it is that way. Thank you. Right? But <laughs> the primary reason is because there's more police in those communities. Yes. Um, the, 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 the challenge is the one, one way you could reduce that is you could pull the police out of those communities, right? If there's not as many police in those neighborhoods patrolling and, and detecting drug use or drug transactions actions, there'd be fewer of those arrests. But people would obviously have concerns yeah. with taking the police out of those communities that are most impacted. Uh, so I think that's that's one of the, the, the reasons behind that. Now we've seen changes, like I said before, in drug enforcement. So the police in Chicago have uh, very intentionally changed their approach to drug enforcement, and they're making fewer arrests for drug law violations. Um, it's easy to argue that there likely has not been much of a change in drug use, um, but the police have changed their response. And it's really the, the reflection of our democracy and the process by which community members raise their concerns about what the police are focusing on and what the police are doing, and elected officials respond. So in Chicago, uh, over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been about an 80% drop in arrests for drug law violations, for drugs that don't involve marijuana. And I kind of separate out marijuana from all the other drugs because uh, arrests for drugs other than marijuana, every single one of those is a felony offense. Mm -hmm. Every single one of those could potentially result in a prison mm -hmm. sentence. Mm -hmm. And they involve the drugs that generally are of more concern uh, to the public, cocaine and opiates and, and things like that. So the police have reduced their arrests for those drugs by 80%. Um, there hasn't been an 80% drop in drug use. That's true. Right? It's just that they're changing their responses and their enforcement. Um, that change just in Chicago, as you pointed out, um, primarily affected specific neighborhoods because that's where the concentration of those drug arrests were occurring. So in the research that we did where we looked at the 20% drop in Illinois' prison population okay. statewide, uh, what we've been able to conclude is that a substantial portion of that decrease in Illinois' statewide prison population can be attributed to the drop in drug arrests from just three to five specific neighborhoods in Chicago. Um, so it really illustrates the impact not only of increased enforcement in specific neighborhoods and how that can drive the prison population up. But when those policies change, mm -hmm. we can actually see dramatic reductions in the prison population as a whole. That's the result of changes in just some specific neighborhoods and just how we enforce or how we approach specific types of drug law violations. You know, that's part of the thing that I was wondering as you were speaking, um, and I'm going to get to it about the legalization of marijuana and how it's going to have a large impact on the state's prison population. but. What I'm seeing, and I live in Inglewood, 
is I'm still seeing the police presence. I'm still mm -hmm. seeing brothers up against the wall. Mm -hmm. I'm still seeing arrests being made. And as I'm listening to you with statistical research evidence, mm -hmm. empirical as it may seem, is crime and arrests are going down. Mm -hmm. But when I'm on the street and I'm looking at what's going on in my community, it seems that nothing has changed. Right. So my question is, do you think that the legal of, legalization of marijuana is going to have a large impact on the state's prison population? Yeah. And, and before I, I, I get into that, I think you're how you frame that question is important. Um, I can provide you with all sorts of objective statistics yeah. and do research that's, that's sound and rigorous. Um, if people's perceptions don't change, then if I tell them that drug arrests are down 80%, but that's not what they perceive, um, their attitudes don't change. They still think the police are there um, arresting a lot of people for drug possession and those kinds of offenses, and that creates some tension and some concern among the citizens. Um, and that's what I try to do in my work, is I try to provide objective research and information um, to try to better educate or make people more aware of what's going on because your day-to-day -day life and what you look at, um, you may focus on certain things or, yeah, you see people getting arrested, but do you really have a, a, the ability to say, is it different from what it was 15 years ago? Yeah. Um, and, and if so, how? Um, with respect to the legalization of marijuana, um, one of my, uh, my, my concerns is that uh, the argument for legalizing marijuana in many ways has been based on this assumption that we send a lot of people to prison uh, for marijuana uh, violations. Um, and, and I think people are conflating marijuana offenses and arrests with all drug arrests. Uh, so the war on drugs that was, was created and, and launched in the 1980s and the 1990s uh, really had nothing to do with marijuana. It was really focused primarily Don't on, on cocaine and in particular crack cocaine. Uh, and then later in the 90s it was methamphetamine uh, use and production. Marijuana really never was a priority or a focus of the justice system. Um, even legally most marijuana offenses uh, when it was illegal were misdemeanor offenses. If, if you're arrested for possession of marijuana in most instances the uh, amount that you possessed uh, wasn't something that could result in your being sentenced to prison. So I say that because uh, you, you could argue for legalization for, for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of Illinois' history, we've sent very few people to prison for offenses involving marijuana. Um, and when we have, it's usually been for the production or, or sale of large amounts of marijuana because okay. the law really restricts prison only to those types of marijuana offenses. Um, now, I think one way that it may change the uh, overall issue of incarceration is the legalization of marijuana may change the conversation around all drugs. Um, currently, in Illinois, we have a, a legal structure where some crimes involving the sale of cocaine or methamphetamine or opiates are legally treated as the equivalent of rape or armed robbery or attempted murder. Um, because of the war on drugs, we really ratcheted up our sentencing mm, okay. for certain drug offenses. So it may be that the legalization of marijuana, while it may not directly impact the prison population, um, I think it will change the conversation in the state to where possibly we recalibrate some of our previously uh, created laws around other drugs and uh, maybe make them less serious felonies or change some of the mandatory sentencing policies around those. Well, I'm going to tell you, let me give you a chance to catch your breath for okay. a second there. You All know, right. I know <laughs> that's a lot of information, and I've got more questions for you. Uh, those of you who are viewing, I would like to offer contact information for Inmates for Change. And in just a few minutes, we're going to get to Dr. Olson's contact information as well. But for those of you who are watching the show and you would like to find out what we do as far as supplementing your existing program in your organizational program curriculum, we can be reached at 773-746-3075. Our website information, as you see just under the phone number, is inmatesforchange.wixsite.com. 
forward slash inmates for change. And our email address is inmates for change at gmail.com. Now, one of the things that we have here when we're going through this, Dr. Olson, is as I'm listening for what well, I was hoping that you'd be getting to, but this is probably coming up in the next question or the next three behind it. Arrest for marijuana does not necessarily mean conviction for marijuana, or is it, what is it now, is it a ticket offense now that you get, but it's still potentially a felony based on conviction? No, I, the, the, the current uh, laws around marijuana, possession of certain amounts of marijuana is no longer illegal. Okay. Uh, you, you can legally possess certain amounts of marijuana. How much? I can um, hear my, my audience asking now. Yeah, I, that, that I don't know the okay. exact amounts. The, the one thing that I would say is, um, for the most part, the amounts that are now legal to possess under the previous law uh, would have been a misdemeanor offense. Okay, so that's um, probably around a bag, about a bag, yeah, which yeah. would be about 5 or $10 worth yeah. of what you would buy on the street and that's a ticketable offense, or as opposed it's, it's to not even a, it's, it, currently it's not even a ticketable offense. You don't get a ticket if you possess marijuana because wow. it, because it's been legalized. Um, but but part of the change in the law was also a reaction and a reflection of what the justice system practitioners were already doing. Um, in a lot of jurisdictions, people arrested for marijuana offenses, particularly possession of small amounts, uh, weren't being processed through the courts. The, the, the prosecutors weren't seeking convictions because they recognized that it wasn't a priority of, of the electorate to focus on those drugs. So in many ways, the legalization of marijuana um, has, has kind of codified what oftentimes was the practice within a lot of agencies. Mm -hmm. um, the justice system realized that the public didn't want this to be a crime that we were seeking convictions on anymore. Well, with that being said, because as much as I want to finish what we're speaking about with, mm -hmm. uh, again, Inmates for Change provides reentry services. And this is pertinent information as to statistically what's going on in mm -hmm. the communities as well as with government and the plans of law enforcement and legislation. Would I be going out of would I be going out of your realm if I asked what type of legislation, organizational support, or community involvement would be needed to significantly reduce the numbers you alluded to just a few minutes ago? Yeah, I, th I think part of it is to th broadly thinking about what I said is is driving some of the increase in incarceration or drove some of the increase. It's, it's where there's more criminal activity, right? Okay. Uh, so, so anything that's done that potentially reduces the amount of crime in a community, particularly violent crime, because those crimes are most likely to result in incarceration and incarceration uh, for a long period of time. So any policies or practices that really do get at the root cause and reducing the amount of crime uh, would be impactful, mm -hmm. right? Those are long-term kinds of things. Okay. You know, businesses okay. investing in communities, uh, social services being available yes. in communities, those are things that, that take a, a period of time to develop. Um, but it's also trying to get people who've gone through the justice system uh, to not come back through it, to not uh, re-offend or get caught back up in the system. Mm -hmm. So efforts like what Inmates for Change is doing to reduce uh, that recidivism and that return to criminal behavior is a positive thing. Yes. Anything, anything that can be done to make that transition more, uh, more uh, effective. Effective, right? Um, but there, there can also be some legislative changes made. I, I, I alluded to earlier the the current state of some of our drug laws. Um, that during the war on drugs, the response by legislators was, "Let's make these." Uh, punishments more severe okay. for certain for certain crimes involving drugs, um, and as I said before, to the point where if you sell 15 grams of cocaine or about $1,500 worth of cocaine uh, in Illinois, that's considered a Class X felony. Um, a Class X felony is an offense for which you have to be sentenced to prison uh, for a minimum of six years, up to 30 years. Uh, the other Class X felonies include. Uh, aggravated criminal sexual assault, uh, armed robbery with a firearm, aggravated battery with a firearm. Um, one of the things we've seen that's driving a lot of the kind of high levels of incarceration in Illinois 
are the extremely long sentences that are imposed and have to be served for those people who commit violent crimes. Okay. Um, so there is some appetite, there's some interest in looking at those laws um, and uh, legislation that would reduce the amount of time people serve in prison. Uh, would also potentially reduce this uh, disparate impact it's had in in certain communities. Um, I think the other thing you know that community organizations or community groups can do um, to reduce crime and reduce the impact in certain communities is to collaborate more with with justice system agencies. Um, the challenge to that is the war on drugs left a bad taste in a lot of communities um, of police occupation and police enforcement and, and, and incarceration. Uh, there have been high profile cases involving police abuse. Um, those things have eroded public trust mm -hmm. in the police and unfortunately in the communities most impacted by crime and violence. Um, it's also one of the things like I described before with economic development, um, improving community police relationships is a long-term endeavor. Um, okay. Undoing the harm or the, the, the perceptions of police abuse in communities isn't something that can be changed overnight. It, it's really going to take a longer time to address those. Well, with that being said, that leads me to my next question. Do you know of any legislation that's aimed at reducing the recidivism we experience in the communities that are so devastatingly affected? Yeah, there, there, are, there are some that are pretty specific, um, uh, not, not to get too far into the weeds, but there, there have been some laws changed in recent years um, to incentivize participation in rehabilitative services for those individuals who go to prison. Um, so there was a law that was uh, passed a couple years ago that gives inmates who participate in rehabilitative programming some extra time off their sentence. Yes. Uh, so it incentivizes their, their desire to participate. Uh, research that we've done has found that uh, that kind of a law or policy not only increases the desire to participate in treatment okay. among people in prison, but it also increases their likelihood that they will actually complete and, and remain in the treatment program. Um, and so that's an example of something that's trying to incentivize uh, participation in treatment um, related to the marijuana legalization, one of the elements of that law that's related to your question um, is a portion of the tax revenue that's generated um, from the marijuana from the marijuana sales um, will be reinvested in the communities most impacted by the war on drugs. And, and violence. Uh, this is a program called Restore, Reinvest, and Renew. I heard of it. Um, so this is part of the uh, marijuana law that was passed, um, but what it's going to result in is um, community organizations and, and groups in specific neighborhoods mm -hmm. being eligible to apply for financial right. resources for right. them to essentially try to undo some of these harms that have been created and get at the things that I, I described earlier as necessary to really uh, stem this, this problem. Investing in communities, providing economic opportunity, uh, providing services to individuals in the community who could benefit from it. I'm going to tell you, that's, this is a lot. This is a lot of information, you know, and it's pertinent information uh, on top of that. And I know it's a lot. Now, I'm going to attempt to put you out on a limb with the next question, Dr. Yeah. Olson. But behind that, I want the viewers to know that I'm going to have some contact information right after this question to Dr. Olson so that those of you who are interested in statistical research or the criminal justice program that you head up over at Loyola or getting involved with um, extending your knowledge as well as your education into trying to help make a difference out here, that information is coming up. The card is sitting right here. But here's the question. Dr. Olson, could you discuss what exactly is involved and how you conduct your research and who is involved? Okay. Um, so really, the, the research that we engage in, uh, the, the first step of it is um, we hear questions raised by practitioners and policymakers. Okay. Uh, those people that are trying to uh, improve the effectiveness of the system raise a question. Um, and we uh, try to determine the degree to which we can provide some kind of empirical evidence or, or research to help them 
better understand the problem okay. and, and better understand uh, how that problem could be responded to. So our role is to be responsive to the policymakers and practitioners um, and perform good, objective, rigorous research. Mm -hmm. um, after we've identified what they're asking and determined whether or not we can answer the question, we figure out how will we answer that. Uh, what kinds of information will we need to come up with uh, answers to their questions. Um, what that relies on is a lot of collaboration. Um, a lot of collaboration with criminal justice agencies, social service providers, other organizations that may have the kinds of information or data or, or knowledge that we can access and examine and summarize um, and provide to those practitioners and policymakers. Um, so there's a lot of kind of the nuts and bolts of research that I won't go into because okay. that gets into some of the, the more boring stuff. Yeah. But really recognizing that the, the process starts with there being a problem identified by, yeah. by people who can actually have an impact on it and then us try, try and provide them with good solid uh, evidence and support to guide their decision making. Uh, the other element of who's involved is um, interested and attentive stakeholders. Okay. Um, you know, there's a lot of practitioners and policy makers that want to go ahead and implement policies and they don't really care about research guiding it. They, they know in their gut what needs to be done. They've got a hunch. They, they want to go ahead and do something. Uh, really, for us to be successful, it requires um, an audience or a group of individuals that's receptive to hearing the information, considering it, um, and then importantly, having the ability to actually act on it. So elected officials that can take what we do uh, and translate in, that into changes in law. Uh, social service providers that can take what we've done and translate that into better programs that serve uh, the population that can benefit from it most. Well, I'll tell you, with that, let me go right into leaving uh, contact information for Dr. Dave Olson. And this will be along the lines of those of you who are interested in long, um, statistical research again and gathering inf information. There may be some questions that you may have about how to volunteer to do something because as Dave mentioned earlier, or I should say Dr. Olson, he's not the only one doing it. There's groups of people, there are organizations that are involved, there's a time element, there's also where you prioritize which questions or uh, mm -hmm. concerns that there may be in this type of thing. So there's room for all, I would imagine, with helping devise policy as well as what projects we're going to undertake and that type of thing. And those of you who would like to get in touch with Dr. David Olson, who's also, again, from Loyola University with the Research, Policy, and Practice Department. Was that a... Center. Center. Yep. I'm sorry. That's okay. His email is D Olson D O L S O N D Olson, the numeral one, at l u c, dot e d u. Now I might have messed it up repeating it five and six times for individuals who might have just been listening to this conversation going, but uh, Dr. David Olson's email address is d o l s o n, the numeral one, at l u c dot e d u. With that being said, and of course, as we're moving along, Dr. Olson, I know I've given you quite uh, a run for your money with mm. these questions that I've been posing to you, and I appreciate you standing tall and keeping your composure and everything right. going. So I can remember back when I first began working in reentry services, I read some of your contributions to uh, the publication of The Sentencing Project, and it reflected statistical references for Sheridan Correctional Center, which is where I was incarcerated at. Mm -hmm. And can you present for us all, for all of us, I should say, uh, I told you I'm from Inglewood, right? Okay. Uh, the ramifications of that report. Yeah. Yeah, so, so this is a, the, the, the Sheridan prison program, um, t to me, is a good example of the efforts to implement a program that's guided and supported by empirical evidence. Okay. All right. Um, so when, when the decision was made to reopen the Sheridan Correctional Center, um, the goal was for it to have an impact on recidivism and, and, and try to meet the needs of people in prison. 
Um, so uh, I was involved in evaluating that program. The evaluation began the day that the program opened. Um, what we did is we did a, a rigorous long-term evaluation of that program. Okay. Uh, and, and the benefit that we had was the people who were running the program, uh, the administration within the Illinois Department of Corrections asked for the evaluation. Uh, they wanted it to be rigorous. They wanted it to be thorough. And they were a receptive audience. Um, and so as we were doing our, our research and evaluation, when we would uncover issues, um, we had an audience that would listen and consider what we were finding and make improvements to the program okay. as it went along. Um, probably the most significant impact of our work in, with Sheridan was uh, when people questioned the effectiveness or the efficacy of providing treatment to a prison population, in particular people with uh, serious substance use disorders, we were able to provide uh, confirmation that the program was having an impact, uh, that it was reducing people's subsequent involvement in criminal activity. Um, there are a lot of programs um, in the United States that are good, effective programs uh, that have not been formally evaluated. There's nothing that can be pointed to to uh, articulate their success. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, if one person comes out of that program and does something bad, um, there's nothing to counter that. There's no, there's no evidence to show that despite this one individual not benefiting, uh, the majority are benefiting. Um, and so I think one of the, the most impactful things our research did uh, was it provided the Illinois Department of Corrections and the Sheridan program with evidence that what they were doing was having an impact. And, and from what I've heard, it's the fact that it's been evaluated that's ensured its continued operation. Uh, when, when there have been decisions about cutting budgets or, or reconsidering programs, um, with Sheridan, they can always point to the fact that this has been evaluated and found to be effective. Um, and I think one of the other things that we found in the, in the research was it can be effective even for people who have histories of violence. Uh, oftentimes, we, we, we as a society don't feel as though people with histories of violence um, are worth providing treatment to or, or are the priorities for treatment. Um, really, the research suggests that those are the individuals who we should treat as a priority mm -hmm. because of the, the potential for them to continue uh, harming communities. But we found that it is actually impactful. And it was also through that research that we found that the inmates that were participating who were eligible for extra time off their sentence uh, for their participation actually had better outcomes. Uh, they stayed in the programs longer. Uh, they completed the programs. Um, and it was the findings from that research that was the support for the legislation that increased the eligibility for those, uh, for those sentence credits. Well, what do you think is the most significant issue related to incarceration that the public does not know about? Yeah. I, I think it relates to what we, just, what we just talked about. I think the assumption that people have is when someone's sentenced to prison that they're rehabilitated. Um, while that's one of the goals of, of incarceration, uh, realize that at least for the last 30 or 40 years, the primary goal of prisons have been punishment. Um, and, and there's a difference between punishment and rehabilitation. Uh, the research consistently shows that reducing recidivism through therapeutic interventions is the more cost-effective way to address crime. And so um, as great as Sheridan is and, and as great of an experience that you had there getting access to services and providing you with some, uh, some skills, uh, it's only one prison out of more than 25 in the in state. state. Um, there are very few prisons that provide the, the degree and a range of services that are provided at Sheridan. Uh, there's a prison in, in East St. Louis called Southwest Correctional Center yes, that operates similar to Sheridan. Yeah. Uh, everybody at that facility is receiving therapeutic services. Uh, but those two prisons combined only can accommodate about 1,500 inmates mm -hmm. out of the more than 35,000 that are incarcerated. So I think one of the things that people need to understand is for most people who go to prison, um, they do not receive much in the way of services or rehabilitation. Uh, they're certainly punished by being incarcerated. 
uh, and they serve their time, but then they come back to their communities, uh, usually with none of the issues addressed that led to their involvement in, in crime in the first place. Uh, the other thing that, that I think people need to recognize is um, there are a lot of people who are in prison for very serious crimes um, who serve an extremely long period of time uh, in prison. And, and as a result of some of our sentencing changes that occurred in the 1990s, uh, we're now incarcerating a lot of people in prison, not because they know that, that they any longer pose a risk to the public, uh, but rather we still want punishment and we still want retribution. And I, I think people need to realize that um, that can be a goal of the system is to impose punishment, uh, but it's also an expensive goal. Um, and, and if someone poses no risk to public safety and they've served a substantial amount of time, um, increasingly we're, we're spending a lot of money uh, to primarily operate prisons that are uh, almost in parallel nursing yes, home facilities. Yes, daycare right. almost, yeah. Right. Uh, I know um, I was on a panel where we were discussing at the University of Illinois the aging in prison uh, aspect mm -hmm. and how guys were sentenced with life and double life sentences, mm -hmm. but it's costing more to keep them incarcerated than it would if they were to receive medical or mental health services out in the free world. Right. And But the sentence dictates life, you know, without parole and the cost effectiveness of keeping someone incarcerated who's suffering through physical, mental, and mm -hmm. all other kind of deficiencies is going to be a budget buster, yeah. if, you know, and yeah. it's that type of thing. Yeah. So we're closing up. We're coming out to about six to eight minutes, and I want to know, that, Mike, do you have any information for individuals who are interested in pursuing a career in criminal justice? Yeah, I, I think that um, part of what people need to recognize is, one, the criminal justice system is more than the police and lawyers. What? Um, a, a lot of people uh, <laughs> that I talk to, particularly parents whose student, who, whose children are interested in criminal justice, they their question is, what is there other than being a police officer or going to law school? Um, and I say there's a lot more yeah. to that, right? So, um, you know, the, the criminal justice system involves a lot of agencies beyond just the police and, and attorneys. Um, there's the traditional frontline staff that we always think of. Um, there's also uh, a lot of people who do human resources, okay. who do research, who, who do things within criminal justice agencies that oftentimes people don't think of. Um, there's also a lot more to the criminal justice field than the criminal justice agencies. Um, there's social service providers, there's community organizations, there's advocacy groups. Um, that employ people to work with this population, to work on these issues, um, particularly with this movement towards uh, criminal justice reform. Okay. Uh, it's given rise to a lot of uh, grassroots organizations, uh, nonprofits uh, that are there not only to serve the population impacted, but to advocate for more effective ways to respond to uh, the problem of crime uh, within our communities. That's something, and thanks for that. Now, let me give a little bit more contact information for individuals for Inmates for Change, 773-746-3075. That number is open from 9.30 a.m. until 2 p.m. Monday through Friday. Email, you can send it at your convenience, inmatesforchange at gmail.com. And those of you who would like to purview the website that we have, inmatesforchange.wixsite.com forward slash inmates for change. And let me right now put some more information back here for Dr. David Olson. Those of you who are interested in becoming uh, career-minded uh, criminal justice and all of the other aspects that it has involved with it, you can give Dr. David Olson an email at d-o-l-s-o-n, the number one, at l-u-c dot e-d-u. Now, Dr. Do Dr. Olson, I'm getting ready to say someone else's name. Uh, would you like to acknowledge anyone or send a shout out to interested parties? Sure. I mean, the, the first I'd, I'd start with is you. Oh, man. For, for having me here. Well, thank you for coming to board. And, and, for, and for doing this work. Um, I think one of the 
kind of the un unsung heroes within the field of criminal justice, especially in the area of criminal justice reform, is all the community groups, social service providers, nonprofits, advocates, uh, they're trying to change the conversation yes, uh, and, and yes, raise sir. people's awareness so that uh, we can engage in more educated and informed discussions. So uh, I appreciate the work you're doing and, and the shows you. that you put on and, and your work in the community. Um, I'd also be remiss if I didn't thank Loyola uh, for providing me and, and my colleagues and, and our students with uh, the support and opportunities to do the kind of work that we're doing. Uh, there's a number of foundations that support our work, the MacArthur Foundation, uh, the Joyce Foundation, the Arnold Foundation. Uh, they have all seen the value of our research uh, to, to create better and, and more informed uh, policies and support practitioners and policymakers who are trying to uh, improve the effectiveness of the system. Uh, and lastly, I'd just like to thank all the people who are out there uh, working on the front lines, uh, from people working in criminal justice agencies that um, are oftentimes uh, unrecognized or criticized for, for some of the policies that they have no control over, uh, for all the community groups that are involved, uh, all the way down to people in individual neighborhoods uh, that see a problem in their community and they try to address it, uh, that see an individual who may be engaged in behavior that puts them at risk. Uh, that engages in a conversation with them to try to provide them with some some different direction. So it, it really is an issue uh, when it comes to crime and addressing crime that we can't rely solely on government to address it. Uh, we've got to look within our own communities, uh, within our own homes, and within our own uh, capabilities to see what we can all do. And there's a lot of people doing great work uh, that collectively uh, is having an impact. Uh, we, we've seen crime go down in the last 20 years. We're seeing drops in the number of people in prison. Um, this is a result of a lot of positive changes of people uh, working within the criminal justice system, uh, within schools, within mental health treatment facilities and programs, um, all the way down to community groups. So uh, okay. there's a lot of, a lot of uh, thanks to go around and a lot of credit to go around. That's great. And I want to thank my viewers for tuning in again at the beginning. We had the esteemed guest today, Dr. David Olson, who heads up the criminal justice program at Loyola University. I would like to thank you all again, and be sure to tune in when you can, because we've got more information coming that's going to be pertinent to statistical research, information about the community, information about prison industrial complex, information about law enforcement, legislation. We're going to be looking at community activities and that type of thing. So we've got a, all type of varieties of guests that we will be interviewing in future shows. I want to say again to you, thank you all, and have a great night. <laughs>